Oh, and the Oscar goes to Green. Hey, I'm on the edge of my seat here, back again with another brand new video, and today I plan on ranking all the Best Picture nominees at the Oscars. The grand award show about movies which I find very similar to another monument of pop culture at large. GameStop! Why GameStop? Because both the Oscars and GameStop are two institutions I held in a higher regard as a child. Back then, I would walk into a GameStop and be overwhelmed with all the different games on display, meticulously eyeing every case, looking to find an acclaimed experience I haven't started yet. As for the Oscars, it was hard keeping up with every single category, but I was still fully tuned into the experience, the hype, the hubris, the grandeur of it all. But as the years went on, cracks formed across my naive spirit spirit, bringing to light the many flaws of each venture. Every passing year, less and less games of interest were placed across the shelves. The more games I played, the more I knew what I wanted and randomly entering GameStop lost all appeal. Every passing year, as I watched more films, I saw many great films completely ignored by the Academy. All the different movies competing while neglecting the ones that could triumph above them all. Every passing year, my appreciation for older generations is ironically rewarded as GameStop removes their older game selections. The GameCube is gone. The PS3 is gone. The Wii is gone. All that's left is the new Xbox, new PlayStation, a Switch which I swear has a shrinking shelf size. Each passing year, the cringe of these stand-up routines becomes more apparent. The game stops have become smaller, the workers more tired, the Oscars lost the hype, the rewards have become more rushed, the ads have become longer, selling your games has always returned pennies, animation is always neglected, this one worker didn't let me buy GTA 5! The place smells bad, Biggie was fat, face it! The Oscars are a sham. However, the nominees for Best Picture this year are mostly really great and worth talking about. It is really easy to get into the dumps about the film industry, but great films are still coming out every year. And in this video, I'll be ranking the top 10 Best Picture nominees. Though, I would like to mention a couple films that I think were snubbed. The Iron Claw, for instance, would not feel at all out of place being considered for Best Picture, and Zac Efron's leading performance easily stacks up among the best of the year. Fallen Leaves is one of my favorite romances of 2023. It's super low-key, gorgeously shot, a very cozy and awkward film. Bo is afraid I would never expect to win anything at the Oscars, but I did really like this three-hour heart attack of a film. It looks fantastic, the score is incredible, the scale is commendable, and this is probably Joaquin Phoenix's most pathetic performance of all time. Saltburn FUCKING SUCK! And John Wick 4 is pushing the envelope for just how good films shot on digital can look, easily holds the best action scenes of the year alongside taking its rightful place as the best in the franchise, the perfect indulgent romp fit for the big screen. But enough of this, moving on to the ranking of the nominees. I found Maestro an overall dull watch despite some really great shots here and there. But that's the thing, are these shots really that great? Writing about Maestro I found to be one of the harder parts of this video. I was considering half-assing this segment because at first, I've only seen the film once and I couldn't lock on to what bothered me about it. After a second watch, what I found exhausting about this film is that the biggest takeaway I got was that Bradley Cooper is really in love with himself and the subject of the movie. But the actual film itself, I don't think had much interesting to say. I see Bradley Cooper's massive eyes, this manic performance, the bizarre voice and inflections, that quote about how Cooper spent six years learning how to compose for six minutes of a scene, and all this combines to make a film that becomes very easy to tune out. I don't think it's a bad film per se, 
Overall, the performances, I think, are mostly solid, and the more subdued scenes, I think Bradley handles well. It's lit nicely, and the shots are nicely framed, but let me get back to those shots. I just don't think the story Bradley has constructed from this man's life is very interesting. I don't know if there was a more interesting facts about his life he could have chosen, but as it is, I found the story of the brilliant conductor, specifically in this film Maestro, to ring kind of mute. But that really wouldn't matter if the way he told the story was interestingly shot and while I keep forgetting to talk about the shots, there's so many scenes in this film where on a surface level I would go, wow, that's a really good shot, no? There's this really bombastic one take right at the beginning of the film and it's like, wow, this one take is so ambitious and you know, it's, you know, it's really good, right? But what kills me about it is that I think 40% of it is CGI. Like the more I look at the scene, it kind of starts falling apart at the seams. I don't like the piece of dialogue that's starts it off, the camera movement is a bit all over the place, and we cut out of it kind of strangely. Like, I would have accepted a film that was more style over substance, but what's happening here is that the style isn't that stylish. If you watch too closely at any scene in Maestro that goes for an ambitious directing choice, you'll see that the film doesn't have full commitment to the decision. There will be a scene that's one take or stationary or framed in an obtuse fashion, and the prevailing feeling is that it could have been filmed any other way. In some scenes, you'll start to see camera movement that's just there for the sake of camera movement, really lacking a solid motivation for the decision. That's my biggest takeaway from Maestro, but I want to offer a disclaimer. I don't think this film does anything aggressively bad, and Carrie Mulligan does terrific work in her role, my ponderings here could be a lesson for myself whenever I seek to make my own film. I think taking the issues with Maestro to heart will fully help me fall into the exact same pitfalls, if not more pitfalls, like a lot. American Fiction was the most straightforward film I've seen of the nominees, and this isn't fully a positive per se. It's a satire where I find the sections that really delved into it to feel more like a B-plot compared to everything else that played out more like a family drama I really liked. Jeffrey Wright is really good as the lead and the supporting cast bounce off him with a nice flow. Sterling K. Brown was especially great as his brother. I think his character could have fallen flat without his commitment to the role. I was just really enjoying the mundane drama with his mother and his girlfriend, I think these small moments were handled really well. And every now and then there will be a scene that's like, you know, whoa, this shit is absurd. And then not soon after the film is over, that ending really did not hit for me. It just kind of ended and that was that. I like these satirical moments, but they did kind of end up being a tad repetitive and maybe they just didn't have enough punch to them. Like you can kind of see some of these punchlines coming from a mile away and it it makes for a good time, but out of all the films, I think this is the one that's stuck in my mind the least. It's pretty good though, I'm just not itching that much for a rewatch. Barbie is the most shocking nomination of them all. Not the first time this has happened, mind you, where a massive crowd pleaser is allowed to be nominated for the prestigious award. Black Panther was one I recently remember. A huge blockbuster centering black people in a cool superhero story instead of a story about a black person like teaching a white person not to be racist, you know, like that, that sort of Oscar bait. Anyways, it lost a green book. Back to another film starting with the letter B, Barbie. Previously, I have released a video covering my first impressions of the film alongside Oppenheimer given that these two films had the incredible unintentional marketing stunt of releasing on the same day. You couldn't have asked for a better stunt. This unplanned experience went so well you know companies will rush to copy its success with none of the authenticity. By the way, you know who went down for her salvage roll? <laughs> Previously, I ranked Barbie an 8 out of 10. But a lot of time has passed, and after a couple more rewatches, it's a 7 out of 10 now. There was a huge shift in how people talked about this film from its release to now. Back then, when it first came out, like all you could hear was about how great it was. But I saw online diehard fans of this film quickly shift into like mini Shapiro's as the month went on. Like, at least that guy hated it from the start, but like, some of you are fake as fuck. As for me, I, I still really like Barbie. I love these sets a ton. I don't think they could have made a better Barbie world than this. I just love the goofy props, the pastel colors. Like, I want to go to the pink beach. I want to go beaching. 
For the most part, every actor is pitch perfect here, like Margot Robbie and Ryan Gosling are incredible as the main leads here, like Robbie embraces the plastic, goofy nature of her persona, while also being able to deliver grief when needed. And Gosling gives one of the best comedic performances in who knows how long. Like, the two bounce off each other perfectly. The soundtrack is dope. I really liked it, except for that one time they repeated the same song two times in a row! WHY DID THEY DO THAT?! The side characters get to kick a few good laughs here too. Michael Sarah played his part well. Simu Liu, I think, should have been used more. I think he's really great as this kind of unlikable rival character. America Ferreira. The biggest detractor in Barbie's case is that I believe the beating heart of this movie doesn't beat nearly as hard as it should. Honestly, I'm very surprised Ferreira is nominated for Best Supporting Actress. This really is not her best work, and admittedly, a lot of it does come from this not being her best character. Without spoiling anything, this role is perfect on paper, but Barbie rushes the hell out of it. The emotional gut punches are just so truncated in her arc, when they should have been the driving force of the film's soul. Another aspect that's modeled a bit is the campy tone. This vibe I think really works for the most part, but there's like a good 20 or so percent where the irony and the self-awareness is too strong, overpowering the sincerity of the camp. If you're too aware about what you're making is camp, you stop trying to make something good and instead focus on making something campy. Like, there's a running joke about how Margot Robbie is the basic Barbie, which at first is kind of funny, but after a certain point it's just kind of like, yeah, why didn't you star a more unconventional Barbie if you're gonna- Oh, yeah. Barbie has a nice arc in her movie, but parts of it kind of feel like they couldn't go all the way because they still had to protect the intellectual property of Barbie. Gotta protect the brand, you know, can't put the character in too bad of a spot, you know? Ken, however, can be put in any kind of bad spot. They don't have to protect shit. And it's the way his story and arc end up the most engaging of the film that's a little silly. He gets to make more mistakes, he has a messier morality, and it just pays off more. It feels like the part of the film with the most focus which isn't the best look for a film called BARBIE! So yeah, that mostly wraps up why I dropped my rating. I still really like it despite its irony, the campiness is still really fun to see. Anyways, back to Black Panther. All things considered, I like the second one better. The Zone of Interest was the hardest film I've had to watch in 2023. My next point will sound like a scathing critique, but I assure you it's more than that. This was the toughest film to watch staying awake. It is a really boring movie, but this style of slow cinema is one I've found consistently hard to connect with personally. I've had a recurring experience where I'll go see a film that has been praised to no end. I'll see this film in theaters, nearly passing out in my seat. On the drive back, my first impression is very negative, but after discussing the film with someone who really likes it, they bring up something that I basically completely neglected during my viewing that makes me reconsider my thoughts on the whole experience. Memoria was that film. Everyone I talked to before said it was the best film of the festival and of the year and I could barely keep my eyes open watching it. I talked with a huge fan of the film afterwards who gushed about just how incredible the sound design was for the film, talking at length about how no other film will take over 10 minutes just to listen to gorgeously crafted soundscapes. That recolored my entire approach to the matter. I still don't love the film Memoria, but there was a whole aspect of it I glossed over way too quickly. I was too used to the longest still shot a film having being under 2 minutes when there's people who grow frustrated with 90% of films having an editing rhythm based out of convenience. A massive collection of quick cuts when they really want a film that lets them zone in on something beautiful for an amount of time most films can't afford to offer. Zone of Interest has a similarly beautifully crafted soundscape, but that isn't what changed my opinion on it. It's upon reading Michael Haneke's thoughts on films depicting the Holocaust where the intent of the Zone of Interest becomes all too clear. Haneke has not commented on the film in this ranking, but he has talked about Schindler's List, elaborating on how disgusted he is with taking an objective, real-world tragedy and using the manipulations of film to draw out subjective emotions and melodrama from their suffering. Jonathan Glazer is clearly motivated by this methodology, as every decision made in the making of this film feels 
like a reaction and correction of a majority of films centered around the Holocaust. If you watch a majority of Holocaust films, you aren't really engaging with the tragedy so much as with a character, or a melodramatic tale at best when they aren't egregiously lying about the event tarnishing the integrity of the victims. Step back four years ago when Jojo Rabbit took its stand at the Oscars. Haneke's perspective is still relevant today. The zone of interest is the much needed depiction of the banality of the Holocaust in a world that is overrun by melodramatic fiction. Every choice from the lack of close-ups, avoidance of displaying graphic content, every choice seeks to avoid exploiting the tragedy. It's beautifully shot, the performances are really good across the board, and the music is fantastic though sparingly used. On the subject of the music, there was one placement I'm very mixed on, but it is a massive spoiler, I can't mention it, it was just kind of out of place. On a rewatch, I could find myself liking this film a lot more, but I don't want to ignore what I felt on my first watch. I have generally found slow cinema to be difficult to stomach. I also don't want to fully commit to Haneke's approach. I find his thoughts poignant because of the current state about how people make films about the Holocaust, but on a long enough time scale, I think only making films about the Holocaust with the methods of the zone of interest could create new blind spots and would require a brand new approach to avoid exploitation. However, that won't be happening for hundreds of years considering Hollywood is in the process of getting the copyright to make a sequel to The Boy in the Striped Pajamas. This was the last movie I had to see to round off watching every single nominee for this video. Thus, Past Lives serves as my final exit into how I think about these collection of films. It's a low scale film, despite the huge time frame of the narrative. For a movie covering 24 years of a life, it is really straightforward. What you see is what you get, which is an intimate, honest, down-to-earth story about yearning, fate, and the insecurities which plague our small cast of characters. What I've taken from this movie is that it is a small collection of moments, and on my first viewing, I just didn't know whether it's an incredible sense of pacing or if the entire experience really does boil down to a few tender moments of a life. Probably a combination of both. Just Past Lives shies away from huge dramatic reveals, and trades them in for just letting the story play out in a more neutral tone. It shifts from beautiful to uncomfortable, and each emotion is scored by a consistent, mellow soundtrack always accompanying each moment. The cinematography always portrays a soft glow, each frame is fuzzy with grain. There is a lot of gorgeous shots in this film. There's a lot to love, though I don't know if this film has fully set in for me. I don't think I've gone through the yearning the writer of this film has been through, and I definitely don't think I've yearned nearly as hard as the mighty potion seller who tragically yearned for potions he would never have and could never handle. He's married to the director of Past Lives, they're married! Ain't that silly. This is a fantastic year for court dramas. I say this only having two 2023 films in mind. SPOILER ALERT! They're in this video. Anatomy of a Fall was fantastic. Sandra Hewler gives an absolute MONSTER of a performance. By the way, I'm saying this with a positive connotation. She has to play a character that's struggling so many different emotions from states of normality, slight stress, full on anger, massive repression, and she also speaks three different languages during the film. This is fucking insane! Everyone else is great too, but she completely steals the show. And I also want to give a special notice to Milo Machado Granier, the child actor for really pulling through with a powerhouse performance. And this script has such a great flow, you're never fully let into the truth, there's always an air of uncertainty. And it creates this vice script that becomes tighter as more accusations are made. Our main lead put through an immense feather and tarring, the ending leaving the viewer with a pitch perfect ambiguity, putting focus on what really matters on this story. The presentation pays attention to a lot of the different ways evidence is collected, recorded, and interpreted. Its direction and consideration of all this just further pushes this incredibly compelling drama to being one of the best films of the year. You owe it not to miss this one. This dog is cool as fuck! Here lies the quintessential Christmas slice of life centering around a cast of outcasts. The holdover struck big with me, which is great considering his previous film Downsizing struck very small with a lot of people. <laughs> 
Here we have a film that is a straightforward slice of life crafted with a cozy 70s aesthetic carried on by three really fantastic performances. This trio of characters are just classic. Paul Giamatti brings a ton of believability to a character that could come off cartoony without the proper care. He's always a joy to watch on screen. It is beyond easy to see why Divine Joy Randolph has won Best Supporting Actress in multiple award shows. She's brilliant at playing this grieving wife with a warm soul. Her portrayal has so much unsaid history performed with graceful pathos. This kid, this is Dominic Sesso's first performance in a feature and he is pitch perfect in the role of this high schooler. He might get typecast in this character because he just embodies the jaded, gifted child with seemingly no sweat. He's incredible. The conversation around the holdovers has been a bit strange though because I've seen some reviews write it off as a cliche by the numbers drama you've seen before. I would agree the film doesn't swing for anything too crazy, but I haven't seen this style of slice of life film in a while. I think it's a fantastic addition to this more low key genre. It features fantastic performances by legends in their field while bringing up a new kid that could turn into a legend very soon. The pacing stays warmly in the middle, not too fast or slow, and I think Time will be really kind to this one. I very easily see the holdovers becoming a yearly seasonal watch for me. Perfectly complemented with a bowl of soup. Any flavor, really? I can't really think of a bad flavor. I can't. Of all the films here, this is the only one I've already talked about in length in my Chicago International Film Festival 2023 video. And after rewatching it, my opinion has not changed. Poor Things is fantastic. It's an uncanny, gorgeous film in every aspect from the story, visual, sound, and performances. Not a single weak link here. This film's perfect as long as you can deal with how explicit it can be. A complete rejection of pretentiousness. It's blunt, it's crude, it's bold, and it's in my top three of all the films released in 2023. Not just the Oscars. And it's funny this is also true of the next two films coming up, but I'm saying these top three are basically interchangeable. These are fantastic. Previously, I released a video covering my first impressions of Oppenheimer alongside Oppen- uh, I mean Barbie! Given that these two films had an incredible unintentional marketing stunt of releasing on the same day. However, despite seeing both films on the same day, I only dressed up for Barbie, so I was a very pink audience member in the Oppen Theater. Previously, I ranked Oppenheimer 9 out of 10, but a lot of time has passed, and after a couple more rewatches, I'm giving it the 10 out of 10 now. I was not expecting this film to rank as probably my favorite of Nolan's career. Tenet had me lower my expectations by quite a bit. Like, Tenet's cool in a lot of ways, but it was so disappointing in many other ways. It's a wonderful thing then, where Tenet failed, Oppenheimer soars magnetically. That's not the right word. Killian Murphy was not lying about this film having one of the best screenplays he's read. The story and character dynamics accelerate at such a dynamic rate. All the different ideologies involved in the development of one of the most horrifying weapons in history is exposed explored through non-chronological narrative, each piece placed to create the most rhythmic viewing experience. The music, while overbearing, is fantastic. This is some of Ludwig Joranson's best work, an incredibly haunting mix of synths and horns. Well, what it sounds like to me, I'm not exactly sure about the synths part, that could be violins or guitar, that's why I'm not composing the movie. And seeing our protagonist be brought apart by the chaos of the world around him. These calling cards are not unique to Oppenheimer, and some of Nolan's flaws per se are still here. His trademark? per se? It's just that in this film, this is some of the best examples of his cliches, the finest craft of them. Nolan can be prone to crafting dialogue that's trying a bit too hard to be epic and sweeping, but I gotta hand it to him. There's so many great lines in this one. Very rarely did I ever feel like something was corny or overblown. I was just with it. Nolan also has a habit of overstuffing his story with too many characters that a lot of them don't get layered with too much depth. It's just that here, he's hired an insane amount of incredible actors. Some who play characters that only appear for a minute or two, but wow, rarely was there ever a moment where I wasn't thinking that they weren't absolutely killing it. Murphy! This dude is always killer in Nolan's movies, and this is his greatest performance of them all, and that statement should not be taken lightly when every time he's acted for Nolan has been nothing less than fantastic. Murphy is a complete powerhouse, and the supporting cast does not slouch, except this one line read of Matt Damon's. Why? Why? How about because this is the most important thing that ever happened in the history of the world? It was kind of funny. Emily Blunt is stunning, super focused and powerful all around. Bendy
Safdie keeps doing incredible performances as characters who do not talk like him. And it's great to see Robert Downey Jr. landing an all-time antagonist role. He is so subtle with how he commands the entire audience's attention. And the actors who have the Herculean task of bouncing off him nail it. Alden Ehrenreich deserves special mention for his masterful maintainment of flow and to say nothing of the gorgeous cinematography. Using the biggest IMAX cameras to capture huge distorted portraits of these tortured souls is the ballsiest shit. What other director has the reach to spend millions of dollars hiring some of the best actors and using some of the most high definition film cameras to film what is a three hour court drama at its heart? Fucking Nolan, man. I love this movie. What can you say about the new Martin Scorsese film, Killers of the Flower Moon? It's a fucking behemoth. An immense runtime of 3 hours and 26 minutes covering a horrific section of history about the murders of the Osage Nation. I find an interesting way to view this film is through the lens of Scorsese's Catholic faith. It is something that heavily informs all of his filmography, but special focus should be placed on his last three films, Silence, The Irishman, and Killers of the Flower Moon are by far the most critical of his faith. To simplify the conversation, by a lot, it seems as he gets older, Scorsese is grappling more and more with his faith as he has to confront the atrocities committed in its name. There is an overarching idea while watching Killers of the Flower Moon that Scorsese maybe isn't the person to tell this story, that he may not be capable of paying respect to the atrocity in the same way an Osage filmmaker could. This is by no means a perfect film, and even some people who helped make the movie have been outspoken about certain aspects aspects which didn't work for them. The most remarkable quality of Killers of the Flower Moon is how open and honest it is about its limitations. Scorsese is not trying to hide away from these criticisms, he is openly embracing this conversation. A conversation that wouldn't be happening if he didn't put everything he had into making a film this bleak and honest about history that no one is attempting to cover. This film takes the perspective of evil men from different sides of the same coin. Robert De Niro is chilling in one of his most sociopathic roles in recent memory, though his accent does kind of slip every now and then, but that's not really a new thing for him. While Leonardo DiCaprio presents fantastic work portraying the stupidity of evil, the complacency and cowardness of being an evil man. On the other side of the moral spectrum lies the beating heart of this film. Lily Gladstone is outstanding at bringing humanity to this story, managing in enormous emotions and navigating her role with such subtlety, even as a side character her presence is overwhelming. This is a slow paced film, but I don't think it's boring. What makes it feel so slow is that there's no place to hide while watching it. Scorsese has previously made films about horrible people, but in those past films there was always a bit of a reprieve from the horror. These previous characters would be violent murderers, but they would have you know these lovely meals together. Even when his money hungry protagonists weren't good enough to prepare lovely homemade meals, at least they made spending money look fun, or they were just at least funny to see. While here in Killers of the Flower Moon, greed is shown for just how pathetic and miserable it really is, applying his previous tropes to a terrifying effect. It looks fantastic, a huge variety of beautiful cinematography capped off with a low hum of a soundtrack bringing together what is my favorite film of the year and my pick for best picture at the Oscars. It lost dope. <laughs> I was planning on releasing this video before the 2024 Oscars happened, however I got sick. But this video wasn't really about the Oscars, it was about the films presented at the Oscars. Perhaps someday I'll make a video ranking every single film I saw in 2023 considering I saw around 58 2023 20, features specifically so far, I'm still missing a few. But thank you so much for watching and I'll see you all then in the next video. Peace out. Ha 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 ha!